I'm gonna show you how to take photos like these with your camera for under $10. First, I'm gonna share with you the camera setup and then some tips to help you avoid some issues that I've had in the past. To set up the camera, you take one with an interchangeable lens such as a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, you remove the lens, and then you put it on backwards. Yes, you heard me right. If you put on a wide angle lens backwards, you get crazy zoom. Doing this is quite simple. First, you take your lens, determine the filter size. If you don't know, it's often written on the back of your lens cap. Then go online and buy a macro reverse adapter ring with that same filter size, and then with the other side based on the camera that you have. So this is a Canon EOS 80D with the EF lens mount system. So this is a 67 millimeter to EF lens adapter that just simply screws onto this lens, and then I can place that on the camera. When you do this, you're gonna get a crazy zoomed in image, but also a very shallow depth of field. That means only a really narrow slice will be in focus whenever you're moving through that image. So this will make it difficult to get these pictures, but it's worth it. The second method is if you already have a macro lens, but it's not giving you enough zoom for what you wanna take a picture of. And what you do is take that same lens that you had before and put it on backwards in front of that macro lens. And the way you do that is with a male to male thread adapter. Again, looking at those thread sizes and you purchase one of these, I'll put a link in the description below so you can find all these things that I talk about in this video. Another option, if you have a macro lens, but it doesn't give you the zoom you want, would be to buy macro extension tubes. And what these are, are tubes that you place on your camera and that distance the lens further from the camera to provide more zoom compared to what you'd normally get just with a macro lens. And the last option is to get a macro lens with crazy zoom capability or even microscope objective lenses that you can put on here. This one in particular is an oldie but a goodie. It's the Canon MPE 65 millimeter and you can get so much crazy zoom with this. It's extremely hard to use, but it is powerful. Let's talk about some trade-offs. Clearly the cheapest is just to take a standard lens, put it on backwards. Now for all these pictures that I will show in here, they're typically taken with a macro lens and then a standard lens on the front of it. I did take some with just this as well, and I'll explain why here in a second. But the difference is, is if I put that macro lens on there, because it has connectivity and I can change the focus, I can move that depth of field, that little slice through the snowflake without changing and moving the camera, where if I just use the backwards lens or if I just use the Canon MPE 65, I cannot do that. I have to physically move the camera. With such a narrow depth of field, you may be asking, how do we get these crisp snowflake images? And the first method is to use a tripod. So I use mini tripods that helps with the wobble and I get it close to the ground or put it on a table like this. And then I might even lay it where the lens touches the ground like this and then I'll have the snowflake on it and then I'll move it around to where I want it, get it set up and then start shooting. Now from there, you can change the focus using the macro lens as well. The second method is what I use for top-down shots of snowflakes on glass. And what I did is I 3D printed a little stand for my camera. And what I did is went to Tinkercad, found a Canon lens cap, cut a hole in the middle, made some little triangle stands for it about the distance needed for the offset with this lens setup. And then I can just simply put the camera right on here. And then I can catch some snowflakes, move this around, find some pretty ones, take some pictures and I'm good to go. Just a note for these two different methods because any little wobble will cause an issue. I do use either a delayed shutter or a remote control shutter release in order to make sure that I'm not moving it around when it's taking that picture. The final method, which I think is the hardest and takes the most practice and patience is the hand holding method. It can be done. I do suggest putting a hand down at the bottom near where you're taking the picture to give you a little bit of stability. This is gonna give you the most freedom to allow you to be able to get a different amount of reflective light. You can maybe even get some thin film interference there where it kinda of looks oily, but this one does take a lot of practice to be able to do. Now, if you're doing this because of the wobble that could come from it, I do suggest maybe using a flash, which brings me to my next subject, lighting. All the pictures you've seen here are not done this way, but one way to hand hold it to help you out is with that flash. So really what it's picking up is that snap of the fingers when that flash hits that thing and not all the other movement that you have, that's gonna help you out. Now this is a nice flash system here. Again, I'll put links to 
everything in the description below, but you can also get a cheaper system such as this, which is just a Pringles can stuck to an old flash, which gets it out there and diffuses it at the end where the macro picture is being taken. Now, sometimes when I've used the tripod method, I have been able to just use the bright sky that's around me in order to light up the snowflakes, but typically it's pretty overcast. So what I do is you can either take just a little flashlight like this one, or this is a lighter light, like a little mini video light. Either of them will work fine, and you either shine it right on the side of the snowflake like this, or on this case, you put it off to the side underneath the snowflake. That gives you a kind of a cool 3D effect. That brings me to the backdrops, and a ton of people ask me, what are those shot on that looks awesome? And the secret is, is with that shallow depth of field, it just blows everything out in the background, so you don't need anything fancy. So for the tripod ones on the cloth, these are actually one or two dollar washcloths of different colors from Walmart. So I picked black, a blue, purple, and a red. And then for the glass, they sit down here below it. So I put them down here and then put the light on top of it. And these are, I don't know, like 29 cent pieces of felt from Walmart, or you can use post-it notes or colored construction paper. Really, it's pretty simple. And since it just blurs everything out, you can't see it. The other piece is this right here. So this piece of glass is actually a shelf from Ikea that goes with those cabinets in the back right there. Works just fine and I just made this piece of wood thing with stands on it, put little sticky things on the top that helps give it a little bit of dampening, but it's really simple. This brings me to the advanced topic of focus stacking and let me explain. You can take a single picture of a snowflake and it looks awesome, but if you want the whole thing in focus, which is something I do, you take multiple pictures, moving that thin slice through the snowflake, getting the whole thing in focus, and then you use post-processing to pull those together in something like Photoshop. And there's a ton of programs that can work just fine to do that. Or you can even manually put them together. I talked about this a little bit earlier, to, but to move that focus through the snowflake, you'll have to physically move the camera with some of these options, or if you have a macro lens with focusing capabilities on the front side, you can change that focus by just moving that a little bit at a time. If you have an advanced camera like the Canon R5 or different ones like that, you might have a focus bracketing mode that will auto scan through the focusing for you taking pictures and you can customize those settings. That is a pretty handy tool to have whenever you're taking these pictures. Now let's talk about some tips. The first one is not all snow is the same. Always go out, take your sleeve, get some snow on your sleeve and check it out. Sometimes they look like little snowballs and other times they look amazing. And you may wanna check this every so often periodically because the temperature and the humidity will change and it may change how the snowflakes look. So all snow is not good snow, so just be warned. Tip number two is catch the snowflakes. If you want the best of the best, you wanna take the cloth out and catch them or take the glass out and catch them as they fall because they are gonna be in their best conditions at that time. Now, if you are new to snowflake photography, you wanna practice and it's not snowing, but there's some on the ground, feel free to brush some of those off. Maybe get a little bit blown onto one of these cloths and practice away, but just know that the best snowflakes are caught fresh. Tip number three is take your snowflake somewhere protected. Now you can't typically go indoors because they'll just melt right away. But what I do is typically try to work under a porch or in the garage. So what I'll do is be able to take the snowflakes, catch them, and then move them in there. The reason is the number of times I've been trying to take a picture and the snowflake blows and moves or another snowflake lands right on the snowflake I'm trying to take a picture of has happened a lot to me. So go somewhere protected. Tip number four is to make sure to freeze your glass or your cloth. You could do this in your freezer, but you could just do it outside as well. So typically a couple hours before it starts to snow, I'll put them outside, cover them up so they're not collecting a bunch of snow on top of them, and then they're ready to go to catch the snowflakes so the snow doesn't melt as soon as they land on it. Tip number five is use a paintbrush to move them around. You need something, a paperclip, a paintbrush, something to help direct your little narrow field of view as you're searching for that snowflake. You might see it, but you're so zoomed in, you might move around over and over and over again and miss it. It's really hard. So if you can have something like this, you'll find it really easy, and then you move to the end of it, and that's where your snowflake's at. You can also reposition the snowflakes with these or move others away from that snowflake to get a better picture as well. Tip number six is dress warm. 
make sure to wear the proper clothing when taking pictures of snowflakes. It can be really cold out there. You can get really into it, get tunnel vision, trying to get these awesome pictures and forget how cold your fingers and toes are. You wanna stay safe, so make sure to dress warm. A bonus tip for you is that you can use different things like sugar and salt and other things like that to practice. And some of the results are actually pretty cool and get you ready for when it snows so you have all your equipment figured out. Just wanted to let you know that I have published a book called The Secret Shapes of Snowflakes. I'll put a link in the description below. It's written for kids, enjoyable by adults, and it will go through different pictures with crazy shapes in them. And I also have on OpenSea captured crystals, one of one NFTs. You can see the collection out there. They are absolutely beautiful. I've hesitated selling them. They look stunning. You can go check them out.